Okay. Just going to mute people. Anyone has any questions? Please unmute yourself. It's been very quiet recently in these shurin. Um, either I've sent you all to sleep or they've been so clear there have been no questions or they've just been so difficult. There's just not been any point to ask any questions, but you're welcome to interrupt. Um, we're going to start from the middle of uh, 49b, Memtet Armoured Base, um, to a point, it's about 18 lines from the bottom. It's a very big page on the Gomorrah, a very full fat page. It's about 18 lines from the bottom, probably about the same from the top. Um, and uh, in the middle of the line, Omar Rebbe Eloza. The line ends with the word Sadoka, and it begins with the word Shadar Khan. So um, five words or so before the end. Omar Rebbe Eloza, God all her oset stocker. We uh, did cover this a little bit last week, but it's important to get back into it because the Gemara is dealing with it more thoroughly. Now, we're going to be dealing with topics such as Stokka and Gimilus Chasodim, which is, I guess, quite an apt topic before Yom Kippur. Uh, Teshuva, uh, Tefila, with Stokka, my rearing as Roa Hagzera, so Stokka is a big thing. But how do we get to into this topic here in this peric of Lulovarova? So um, we've gone through a little bit of a roundabout journey, as we often find in the Gemara. Um, some while ago, the Gemara identified a possum that helped it uh, determine the characteristics of the Mizbeach and the, if you like, the pipework that um, takes the fluids, the, the wine and the water from the Mizbeach down to the depths below. And it used a possum uh, to teach us something about. It was a drashaf, rather far-fetched drashaf, but it gave us, uh, when interpreted, a description of that underground network. Um, and the posset that was then used, uh, the Gemara said, well, Rabbi Eloza, the sage Rabbi Eloza, uh, translates this in a completely different way, um, which has nothing to do with the use of it for um, the libations on Sukkot. But since we mentioned the posok, we went on to the tangent of the posok, which brought up to Rabbi Eloza. And Rabbi Eloza mentioned uh, it, the uh, drasha for this posok in relation to Chesed and Stoka. And, and the Gemara now then went on a further detour. So, well, now we're talking about Stoka and Chesed. Uh, Rabbi Loza had some other nice things to say about Stoka and Chesed. So, that's why we're on this ramble now through the world, world of Stoka and Chesed. It really has nothing to do with the topic of the Gemara, but we've moved on to from tangent to tangent. So I'm going to take you to this starting point again, which, as I said, was about 18 lines from the bottom. Omer Rebbe Loza, Rebbe Loza said, God all her oset stocker, stock is the final word on that line. God all her oset stocker, Yosef, Yosef, me call her korbonos. Rebbe Loza is giving us a few superlatives over here. Someone who dispenses tzedakah is performing a mitzvah greater than those who bring korbonos bringing a carbon to the base on Mikdash, uh, offering it up um, a, 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 even as a carbon toda because of your uh, thanks for Kodesh Baruch Hu's Yeshua's or uh, as some other commemoration. Um, if you uh, give stalker, you will have performed a bigger mitzvah. Given a choice between stalker and bringing a carbon, give stalker. That's what Rabbi Lazar is saying. But he brings a posset from Mishle, Shenema, the Posak says in Mishlei, Asot Stokka or Mishpat, Nivcha la Hashem Mizavach. Someone who does uh, Tzedaka or Mishpat, uh, hey, we are Stokka, and also Mishpat, uh, he deals uh, fairly or in good judgment with other people, Nivcha la Hashem Mizavach. It is more acceptable and is more choice. To a Kodesh Baruch Hu, then Zavach, but a Zevach, a Zevach is a korban. His Vach means to Shechet as well. So better is Tzedakah, this uh, Posik suggests, than a korban. So that's the, uh, if you like, the source from a Posik the Rabbi Laza brings. Interestingly, some ask this question to say, hey, this Posik doesn't prove it at all. We wanted to prove from the Posik that Tzedakah on its own 
was better than a carbon. But the Possek doesn't say that. The Possek says, Staka umishpot. Maybe it means um, that only a person who is strong in both these areas, what is Staka? Staka is giving to people who are in need. Mishpot, really, he means dealing fairly with people. Um, if you're not a dayan, you can't dispense Mishpot as a judge, but you can deal fairly with people. So um, maybe it's referring to not just Sadakra towards Aniyam, but someone who is uh, absolutely um, superlative in his dealings with his fellow man in Beinald of Lachavero. If he does both of these things, then that person is doing is at a level greater than someone who brings a carbon. But who says Sadak on its own or Mishpat on its own? So that question has been asked. And the answer given is often, if you look at the post, it went on to say Nivchar la Hashem. That's in the singular. It is preferable. And really, if we meant that you had to do both, then the Possek should say doing them both is preferable or they are preferable. But since it's in the sing singular, it indicates that stock on its own and maybe mishpot on its own as well, dealing well with your fellow man. Each of these puts you at a higher level than a person who simply brings a carbon. And again, when you look at statements like this, they can't be taken totally as face value um, because like everything else, a person can do stocker and mishpot in a certain way, which, which elevates him and shows him up to be a, an extraordinary person. He can do it at a lower level. And in the same way, a person can bring a carbon just because he feels it's expected of him. His next door neighbor brought a carbon to Yerushalayim and he feels he looks silly not doing the same thing and he brings a carbon. Another person could bring a carbon because he really feels that it will connect him to a Kurdish Baruch So there are um, levels, there are madrigot in, all, in both the bringing of a carbon and also in the way in which one dispenses stocka. And uh, the Gemara is actually going to mention this later on, that Sadaka itself isn't a one dimensional mitzvah. It's, it's a mixture. It's a mitzvah that has many facets to it. And depending upon how many facets one invests in it, one can perform the mitzvah at Stocker better or worse. Uh, and the individual should always strive to uh, perform the Stocker in the best possible way. So we will see. As we carry on, we'll look at that aspect of giving stock. But this first statement of Rebbe Loza, um, <clears throat> uh, put giving of stock at a higher level than bringing a carbon. So it's stocker is superior. But then the Gemara goes on to say, the Omer Rebbe Loza. Rebbe Loza went on to say something else as well. He said, Gedola Geminas Chasodem Yose Minat Stocker. Sadaka may be superior to bringing a carbon, but there's something even better than stocka, and that's gemilas chasodim, doing chesed. And what do we mean by that? Gemilas chasodim is something you actually do. It's not just giving money to someone. It's helping a person. Um, in fact, giving a person a loan isn't stocka. That's actually considered to be gemilas chasodim. Sadaka is something you don't expect anything back. You're, you're giving someone something, and you are uh, taking leave of what you give. A loan is something that you expect back, but if you give someone a loan and they need that in order to establish a business, that's gemilas chasodim. Um, if you help a person, if you if you visit the sick, if you are if you um, uh, dance before a chosan and color, some of these things are also considered to be um, uh, gemilas chasodim, um, doing well with people. So there are many aspects uh, to gemilas chasodim, but they basically require kindness. Someone who physically dispenses kindness is doing something even greater um, than giving off uh, than, than giving off tzedaka. Um, and how do we know? Shenema, so here also brings a posuk. It's a lovely posuk from Hoshea. Ziru lochem litzdaka, the kitzru lefi chesed. That um, planting is equivalent to stocker. Putting the seed into the ground to uh, bring up a plant is considered to be tzedakah. And that's a great thing because you're seeding an area of the ground that was barren. However, better still is the kitzru lefi chesed, is when you reap, when you cut down what you planted, that is equivalent to chesed, if you like. This possible mentions both stocker and chesed. And it says stocker, is akin to planting, and chesed is akin to reaping. 
So why does it make chesed better than stocker? He carries on. Im Adam Zareya, if a person plants, places seed into the ground, sofik ochel, sofik any ochel. There's a sofik whether he will be able to eat anything that emerges from this sapling or whether he won't be able to. The weather may uh, inundate it, it may be scorched, some may be pull out the, uh, the plant by its roots. So therefore it has an unknown end product. You don't know whether this plant which you're seeding will come to fruition. You hope it will, but you can't be sure. However, Odom Kotzer Vadayochel, if a person is already at the point, point of reaping, in other words, he's cutting off the plant, he's cutting off the fruit, he's cutting off the corn or the grain, then Vadayochel, this is at a ready stage. So here we know it's really going to happen. Uh, so which, which does a person prefer? A person prefers to reap rather than to plant. Obviously, you have to plant in order to reap. But at which point do you celebrate more? You don't celebrate when you plant because you don't know what the end product will be. You celebrate when you've reaped, when you've taken it in. Now you know that you've succeeded. And in fact, there's a lovely comparison here with um, Tzedakah as well. If you uh, give Tzedakah to a person, just simply giving Tzedakah, that's just like the planting. Why? You give it to a person and you give it to him, but who knows whether he's the right person to give it to? Who knows whether he won't abuse it? I used to give stocker to someone in London many years ago, and we used to see this guy going in and out of the betting office to put the money on horses. People knew he put the money on horses. He was a gambler. So who knows whether, in fact, anything positive, maybe he'd win a jackpot, who knows, but let's assume he won't. Um, but essentially, it was a wasted stocker. Whereas if you do chesed with someone, that's never wasted. If you help a person with something, that means the person needs your assistance, then that's not wasted. There's no doubt there that that chesed was invaluable to him and was useful to him. So it's like a tzira. It's a finished stage. It's something which helps with certainty. So you don't have to make a gamble. You don't invest in a gamble as you do when you, when you plant or when you give stock. Giving stock is a great mitzvah, but it's still... Uh, it's it's a means to an end, but you don't know whether that end will, will truly emerge from that means. So that's uh, Rabbi Loza. So Gilminus Hasodim has the, all these great advantages over uh, Sadaka. If you've got a choice, you can give of your time and you can give your advice and you can help someone physically do something. That is uh, a bigger mitzvah than actually giving of money. Uh, Eli, yeah. Eli. Yes, um, Tzedakah is voluntary. Yes. Um, which carbonate are voluntary? Oh, a lot of that. You can bring a carbon shlomim. You can bring it at any time, a garbage carbon shlomim, which is what's called a peace offering. Or if you, if, if you felt that you've had a good break on something, you were, you were um, uh, saved from an illness, you bring a carbon toda. But the carbon shlomim was probably the most common carbon, that is a nidova, that is a korban nidova. I'm not talking about a chatot, which you brought because you had unwittingly uh, sinned and transgressed the negative precept, but uh, there are plenty of positive, uh, positively voluntary korbanot. Okay, so that would be the equivalent of giving tzedakah. Okay. So the Gemara goes on to end with another description by Rabbi Eloza of the mitzvah of, um, of stocker. And he says something interesting here. He says, Ein stocker mishta lemes ella lefi chesed sheba. He's going to quote this posse again to give us a slightly different slant. He's not going to compare tzedakah with chesed. He's going to look at the um, way in which one dispenses tzedakah itself. That there are there is a chesed way of giving stocker and there's a less chesed way of giving stocker. Focusing on stocker, how do you give stocker? So he says, sadaka, the sirka you get, the reward the person get, gets for giving stocker is dependent on the chesed that he invests in the act of giving stocker. And the simple thing is, you know, if you smile at a person, give stocker, then it's better than if you grimace at him and just throw the same amount of money on the ground. But he doesn't understand it in that simple way. That, that, that simple level of chesed in the stocker isn't necessarily derived from this posse. It's considered to be patently obvious. 
Um, but there's, there's a different aspect over here. Uh, but let's just carry on with the um, possum, then we'll see what, he, what, what does he mean, the chesed in the stocker? What examples? Rashi will bring examples of what it means. Chesed, which a person invents, best in the stocker. And that is a measure of how great that stocker act was. Shenema is bringing this possum we saw before as well. Zero lachem litstocker, a kitzra lefia chesed, that. Um, a person, it, it, when he gives tzedakah, it's like planting, zero, putting the zera, the seed in the ground. But kids are lefi chesed. And when you reap, it's lefi chesed. But he's learning a little bit differently over here. He's saying the kitzru here is not talking about giving his chasodim. The kitzru is the sacha, the you, the giver of a tzedakah, earn in God's eyes. Zero lorachem litzedakah. Give away tzedakah, which is a seed you plant for the aniyim. And then if you do that, then you, the giver, will be kitzur lechfi chesed. You will reap what you've sown. You've sown a mitzvah, you will reap, you will receive the reward. That's the, 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 the kitzir I refer to over here, it's quite clever. Lefi chesed, according to the level of chesed which you've invested into that act of stocker. So let's just, just try and get a, a handle on what he means by um, the chesed. So Rashi says, <clears throat> for example, he said, he gives lots of examples of a person who is investing chesed in its stocker. If you've got a choice, you know there's a poor person in the town, don't wait for him to come out into the marketplace and give him that stocker there. Why don't you go to his door, knock at the door and give him some stocker or put something through his letterbox. So you actually, bring the tzedakah to him, rather than him having to, to seek you out. That's one idea. Um, or you give him something which is closer to the final product that he can use. Normally, when we give tzedakah, we give money. Well, if you give money to an ani, he can't eat that money. He has to translate that money into something useful for him. So he's still got to go to the local store. And in the old days, he might even have to, you know, pound the grain and whatever it is, depending what you you gave him, it's not the finished product. Nowadays, you can just go into the local bakery and take out you know, anything you want finished, but it wasn't like that in those days. Um, and, and indeed, he may need clothes to keep him warm, etc., etc. So if you can deliver a finished product, in other words, instead of money, Tzedakah, you give that person food, or you give that person clothing that they may need, then that is already an end product. You've had to invest extra effort in, if you like, Trans, uh, translating the cash into a finished product, and that product you deliver uh, to the um, to the to the oni, then that's a big advantage. Giving him baked bread already, so he doesn't have to have to go out uh, and buy these things. And he gives another example, which is actually very interesting. Rashi gives another example of chesed invested in stocker, and this, that is to um, time your delivery of the stocker, even if you give money, time the delivery of money at a time when the uh, Oni will be able to put it to optimal use. So he says, you know, an Oni will go out and buy certain types of food, but at the time, and perhaps even today as well, depending upon the time of year, the food products could be more expensive or cheaper. You should particularly try time that stocker to when the price in the marketplace is lowest. So he'll be able to use the stock you give him most efficiently and most optimally. It's a very financially aware aspect here of giving chesed. I mean, nowadays you might say that if you're going to give an on each stock, you give it to him just before Black Friday. Isn't that when everything is cheapest in the stores, right? He'll be able to get his kettle from Shechem Electric, you know, at 30% discount. He needs a kettle, maybe. You give it to him just before Black Friday, and he will optimally use. There's no point giving him a week after Black Friday where everything's back again at a normal price. So timing the event of Stocker is also uh, an act of chesed in Stocker. And the level of Stocker that you have achieved will depend upon the amount of effort and the amount of chesed you've invested in the act of Stocker. You can think of many other examples, uh, I'm sure, as well. 
Okay, that's Rabbi Eloz. Another Gemara goes on. Uh, it's still on the subject of stock and chesed. You know, once we're on this topic, um, the sky's the limit. So the Gemara now brings a brisa. Tonu Rabbonon. Our rabbis taught um, uh, Tanaitic material in a brisa. Bishlosha devarim gedola geminas chasodim yosem in atstoka. Geminas chasodim is superior to the act of giving stocker in three ways. It has three advantages over giving stock. Three milers, as they say. The first one is Sadoka Bamamono, um, Gimilas Chasodim Bain Begufo Bain Bamamono. Sadoka can only be done in a narrow way. This is really just that if there's a very la narrow, um, what's the word? Opportunity uh, area in Stocker. You, you give it with your money. I mean, you might be able to buy clothes or whatever it is and give it to him, but it's just giving him something uh, uh, which he puts in, which you put in his hands, and that's it. It's, it's a gift. Whereas Gemilas Chasodim can be done both with your money and with your body. In other words, you can physically help a person. You can unload their donkey. You can help them, you know, get their home cleaned or do shopping for them if they need it. Whatever it is that they, you can uh, help in their funeral expenses or be with some echos of the color, et cetera, help an old lady cross the road. So here is a mitzvah that can involve not just you giving money, but literally your body can be placed into it, which, which elevates it. If you like, there's a capitalistic idea really that a person should try and get all his limbs involved in doing mitzvahs. Yeah, they, they, they bring various pasukim on this kol, kol, atzmosai, uh, tomar, etc. All my bones, all my uh, limbs should be involved in avodas Hashem and in ben adam lechaveiro. And if a person can use maximally his, his bodily faculties in performing a mitzvah, that sort of expands the, uh, the level of the mitzvah. And therefore, since it can be done with gufo, um, as well, it makes it a more widespread and a more uh, all-encompassing mitzvah. And ben mamono, you can also do gemilas chasodim with your money. What does it mean? Isn't that sadaka? So I said before that giving a loan is actually considered to be gemilas chasodim. It's interesting because you would have thought that sadaka, um, that we, we you would have thought that giving stocker to a poor person would be better than giving him a loan because he has to give back a loan. And yet here we're saying that giving a loan is part of Gemilas Chasodim, which is superior to Tzedakah. So it would seem from this point here that giving a loan is superior to giving the guy Tzedakah. Now that's, that's a very superficial reading, of course, because if you give a person a loan, it's usually because the person wants to use the loan to grow a business or to start something. You don't give a person a, an oni a loan to buy a loaf of bread. So therefore, they, we're really talking about two different areas of kindness. Giving stock or is something really for fairly immediate use for someone who hasn't got the basic needs. Giving a loan is to try and build someone up. And the Gemara is saying that's a tremendous mitzvah to build someone up. And uh, Rambam has all these different levels of of, of stocker and you know actually allowing a person to grow and to become self-sufficient by helping him finance his activities and building himself that itself is a very great mitzvah and I, I've seen there's also another commentary which is very nice as well it says in some ways you could actually say that it's kinder to give a loan to an oni than it is um, to give him stocker because every time an oni receives stocker there's a certain amount of shame involved and they're receiving something uh, for nothing um, and they don't have to give it back and uh, of course they become accustomed to shame but uh, there is shame involved in receiving stock but there's no shame involved in receiving a loan we will happily go to the bank and want a huge loan to buy a house we don't feel ashamed we feel entitled and um, if a person provides a loan to someone to help them expand then the person receiving it feels uh, that essentially a sense of partnership certainly does not feel a sense of shame. It may feel a sense of responsibility, but not a sense of shame, uh, which is why offering things in a loan can actually be kinder to the recipient than giving money away. Um, now, uh, some people give Sadaka this way, and they, they essentially um, win on both fronts. That, you know, that I, they say to a person, I'm giving you this as a loan, when you can give it back 
you know, it'd be lovely to have it back. The person doesn't feel so ashamed, but at the same time, there's almost a wink between them that the, um, the lender is very happy to write off the loan. And he's only doing this in all order to uh, soothe the feelings of the recipient. And obviously that's the very, very top level of giving stock up. To say you're giving a loan when you really know that you're never gonna call on that loan and that the individual understands that that may be the case. So that would be the, um, the post-grad level of, uh, of, of, of chesed. Um, because it's, it is it is appears to be gemilas chasodim, but it's also but it's really an act of stalker. Okay, so that's the second way in which gemilas chasodim is better than stock, and that it can be done in a multitude of ways, including your 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 lending money and in uh, in physically um, in assisting that individual. And finally, stalker <coughs> lo aniim. You only give stocker to poor people. A lot of this is so obvious, but it, the Gemara is just telling you the obvious. Um, you give stocker to poor people. Gemilas chasodim beinliyaniyim beinliyashirim. Oh, actually, this is part of the same thing. Um, Sadaka is given only to aniyim. The gemilas chasodim you you can apply to anyone. Anyone, everybody needs help at some time, even if they're the uh, Bill Gates might need some assistance from you sometimes. Supposing he were to trip. On a, on a pavement or a sidewalk even, in, in Yerushalayim and he's paying a visit, yes? And you're the only one around, you might have to call Hatzalah, that's Gemilas Chasodim. You, you know, he doesn't want Sadaka from you, he's not a noni, but he might want Gemilas Chasodim. So Beila Niem Beila Shirim. And finally, Staka Lachayim, Gemilas Chasodim Bein Lachayim or Bein Lamesim. Stocker can only be done with living people. You can only give stocker to a live recipient. But Gemilas Chasodim uh, can be done to someone whether he is alive, whether he's dead. What does that mean? It means Halvoyas um, Hames, all the mitzvahs involved, you know, uh, of respecting the dead, of burying the dead, of helping to pay uh, funeral expenses for someone. Um, uh, even visiting the shiva houses, etc., which is in a sense a respect for the for the nifter as well. So, again, gemilas chasodim is all encompassing uh, in terms of its time span as well. Okay, so that was that particular price. So a lot of these things we could work out for ourselves, but the Gemara fleshes them out and uh, um, and gives us interesting insights here as well. But now we come back to Rabbi Loza again, right? So we're, uh, we're, we're progressing. Rabbi Loza was very big on chesed and stalker in terms of his agatic writings. And he said the following, Stalker mishpat ke'ilu mile kol ha'olam kulo bechesed. <clears throat> that if a person performs some stalker or mishpat, let's, let's refer to the stalker side again, it's as if he filled the whole world with kindness. But he's doing something in a small way to one individual, but somehow that has ramifications, if you like, uh, through the whole world. How come? Shenema, no logic, simply a posik. What is the posik saying to him? Oh, heb stock or mishpat, chesed Hashem moloch oritz. Someone who performs at stocker and mishpat, in that situation, when a person does this, someone who loves it to do it and does it, the reward is chesed Hashem haaretz. It doesn't say chesed Hashem comes on him. It says mol haaretz, that something which you've done particularly and individually has universal ramifications. The, uh, it has um, uh, an impact far wider than in the small environment in which you've operated in. Very nice idea over here. It means everybody's important. If you do a small act of chesed, you're not just a small drop in an ocean, you actually cause the ocean currents to move. That's how you can move the world um, by, uh, by a small act of kindness. And now the, now the Bryce says something, or he says something quite remarkable here. Uh, it's not clear exactly what it means. Shema Toma, you might say, kol haba likpots kofates. Anybody who wants to jump can jump. Talmud Loma, we'll explain that in a moment, not easy to understand. Talmud Loma, to correct that thought, 
the, the Apostle says in Tehillim also, Mayoka Chastacha Elohim. How precious is your chesed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, what does it mean, kofets? Anybody who might wants to jump is allowed to jump. This is not talking about hurdles or anything like this. He's saying that a person should, uh, every person should strive to do chesed, because if you do some chesed or tzedakah, uh, it's monocolorics. It has all these huge ramifications. But then he goes on to say that you might think that everybody can be zocha to the mitzvah of chesed and will be able to find a recipient who's worthy. How do you know that your act of chesed has really met the mark? Maybe it's wasted. How do you know that you've really succeeded in your act of chesed? So the, you might think that anybody who does any act of chesed automatically has succeeded in reaching the mark. And therefore he quotes a posok, how precious is chesed. If you really want to merit having dispensed chesed, it's very, pre the opportunities for doing so are precious. Let me understand this myself. As if to say that of every 100 people thinking they performed chesed, only maybe eight have. Why? Because it's only a precious few. There aren't many of these opportunities around. What does that mean? When I see an old lady wanting to cross the road and I take her across the road, did I fail on the majority of occasions? It would seem from here that a person shouldn't take for granted that when they've done what they think is an act of chesed, that they've really met the mark. Um, and they may not have, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu only validates the chesed done uh, by a precious few. Um, it's something which is expensive and it isn't always available. And moreover, a person has to look hard in order to find such an opportunity that he really has done, has done stocker on a scale that is, that is appreciated by Kodesh Baruch Hu. Again, I can't explain this very much. It's almost as if to say that we can't be the judges of when we've done an act of chesed. We have to do the best we can. We have to look for the best opportunities, not take for granted that just what is available to us uh, at our hands with hands reach is chesed. We may have to search further and wider a field in order to be able uh, to achieve um, um, that level of chesed. And then, but then he goes on to say, yochel, but then I might have thought, af yereshamayim, Cain, that even someone who's God-fearing may not have an opportunity. If it's so precious, the act of, of doing stocker properly, if it's so precious, in other words, it is so rare, something that is precious is rare. If it's not rare, it's not precious, right? So it's supply and demand. So if it's so precious, which means it's so rare, maybe even a God-fearing person may never find the opportunity to dispense chesed in the right way, to give stock in the right way. Therefore, Talmud Loma, he goes on to say, that's not the case. There, there's, it goes on to say, to hit him, the chesed Hashem may olam ve'ad olam al yirei of. For those people who are yirei of, those who fear a Kodesh Baruch Hu, there will always be chesed. But for other people who are not God-fearing, they may not always be chesed. Or the acts of chesed that they dispense may not actually be judged as being acts of chesed. So it's a little bit of a riddle over here exactly to me, what constitutes chesed? How do I know if I have accomplished my act of chesed or my act of stalker or not? Um, do I weigh it up or I don't weigh it up? I just have to make the best I can, but not to run, not to be, if you like, uh, pumped up with pride that you've done something which you think is good, because who knows? Maybe it wasn't as good as you think it really is. Don't think that the opportunity to do chesed in the right way is there all around you. The potential may be around you, but your success rate may actually be quite low. I leave it to you to try and work out um, exactly um, what that implies. Um, I'm not at all sure um, uh, what it implies. Now, I did have something to share with you on the screen over here. So you don't have to stare at my ugly face all the time. But I, 
Not sure. Mm, just the pos the pasukim that I I granted to you. I don't think they're really uh, of any great interest. I'm going to stop sharing uh, because the pasukim were really um, self-explanatory. Okay, chesed is important. It is uh, important to try and uh, grab the right opportunities. You don't know you're always going to be given those opportunities. It requires a God-fearing person to be certain that they're going to be zocha, that they merit to those opportunities. Okay, now the Gemara brings another drosha, which is very interesting. Um, and it has a very, it's only very slightly connected to what we've done. And the connection is this posse we just quoted, chesed Hashem may olam vad olam al yireyav. That Hashem's chesed will always be on those who fear him, those who are yirei Hashem. So, Omar Rabbi Chama Bar Chama, Papa. Rabbi Chama Bar Papa said the following, kol adam sheyesh alav chayn, very strange statement. Every person who displays chen, you say a person has chen. Good translation in English, yet to be coming. No one has actually translated. The word chen is like, it's like one of these Yiddish words, totally untranslatable. Someone whose face manifests chen to others, be your dua shu it is obvious from that, it is clear and unambiguous that such a person is God-fearing. Shenema, from this posuk, the chesed Hashem may olam but olam al And here the word chesed is being used as a substitute for chen, as a synonym. If you remember, in the Gilles says Esther, it says that es about Esther, but tisar chen chesed, I'll call ro'eha, whatever it is. Her face displayed chen and chesed. So chen and chesed, are used here as a synonym. Synonym. So what is the Tosik saying here? It's saying that the chain of HaKadosh, but chain Hashem me'olam ve'olam ad al yireyav. Any God-fearing person displays chain because that chain is al yireyav. It's like a halo which can appear on the person. If a person is yirei Hashem, he displays that on his complexion. Now you may or may not actually agree with that, but that's what the Posik is saying. There's some physiological link between a person's Yeras Hashem and their expression. Sometimes Chain is translated as charisma, but it'd be completely wrong to do so here because the person's charismatic that they have Yeras Hashem. I had somebody said to me that Adolf Hitler was very charismatic. He certainly wasn't Yerei Hashem. Charisma is something different. Chain is something that there's a glow of kindness and of refinement that, 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 sh that shines through their face. A person who, who displays chen physically is a Yirei Hashem. Can we be so sure? So, so over here, what I wanted to do is to take a little diversion on a similar topic. And this question really is, to what explain, extent can you read a person's character um, by their expression. Does a person's expression or their facial features denote their character now? You know, the Nazis you know, seem to be able to measure you know, the distances between the nose. And you know, this, this was done very early on to try and say uh, what a person's level of intelligence or civilization was depending upon their, their, their facial characteristics as measured. That's considered to be uh, very much a, um, uh, a, a debunked activity. But there's a suggestion over here that chen is something that, that suddenly that appears on the face if they if they are Yirei Shemaim. What I want to do is to take you to a famous statement. I'm going to share a screen with you now um, because this is a remarkable story which try and get there. Which one is it? Okay. Now, the Tiferes Yisrael is a commentator in the Mishnah. He's one of the most famous Mishnah commentators. So the, uh, um, see, I have his dates up over here, 1782 to 1860, Rabbi Yisrael Lipschitz. And um, the main, the classic Mishnah, which is the Yachin or Boaz Mishnah, 
large amounts of the commentaries and the pages are that of the Tiferes Yisrael, such a famous commentary he produced. It's an absolute classic. In the Tiferes Yisrael, he comments not only on the halachic sides of the Mishnah, but on the agadic sides as well. Like he has an enormously detailed um, interpretation of Pirkei Ovis, which is more a gavda than it is halacha, and it's about character traits. And he's very strong on that. Um, he was quite controversial at the same time. He wrote a famous essay in which, uh, even pre-Darwinian, in which he tried to explain um, the existence of fossils um, woolly mammoths, etc., in terms of Kabbalah, the, uh, the cycles of creation and destruction, in a very, very long essay, which was criticized by some people as being none of his business to write stuff like this. What does he know about this? But he was very interested in that. He was interested in the world. And on a Mishnah commentary in Kiddushin, uh, which shouldn't uh, really concern us now, although it's a very interesting commentary in itself, uh, he brings a Medrash a legend, and I, I have it in my Mishnah, yes, and so I'll explain to you later on, that the, uh, my Mishnah luckily was not censored. On many censored versions, the piece we're about to read was left out because it was considered to be out, totally outrageous. So we're now going to read some of the outrageous uh, commentary of the Tiferes Yisrael, except by everyone to be a classic gone commentary on the Mishnah. It's not controversial. It's not even like Rav Cook. It's like Rashi, I mean, talking about that sort of level. But this is, this is what he says. So he brings this, and we'll read this together. This accords with a delightful account I once saw in writing. This is in his commentary on the Mishnah. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, the nations heard, they trembled, etc. They were particularly curious about Moses, the man through whom all these marvelous deeds had transpired. So much so that an Arabian king sent a gifted artist to the Israelite encampment with orders to paint a portrait of the Israelite leader and to return with it to Arabia. The artist went, painted the portrait of Moses and brought it to the king. The king then sent for his physiognomists, good words, and ordered them to prepare an analysis of Moses' character, virtues and strengths based upon his facial features as reflected in the portrait. It's not interesting. The physiognomists complied with the king's order and reported as follows. If we are to render judgment solely on the basis of the facial features in the portrait, we must report, O king, that despite his distinguished reputation, he is entirely wicked, arrogant, greedy, capricious, indeed suffused with every known vice. Upon hearing the analysis, the king was livid. You're sporting with me, he cried out. From every corner of the globe, I've heard just the opposite regarding this great man. The physiognomists and the artist were seized with fright. They responded to the king pusillanimously, each accusing the other of incompetence. The artist claimed that the portrait was executed with precision. It was the physiognomists who had erred in their interpretation of the portrait. The physiognomists, in turn, claimed the artist, claiming that the portrait of Moses was obviously inaccurate. The king, determined to resolve the matter, set out in his chariot on a state visit, accompanied by his troops to the Israelite camp. Upon sighting Moses, the man of God, from the distance, he took out the portrait, gazed at it, and at Moses, and knew at once that the artist's depiction had been executed with precision. The king was astounded. He entered the tent of Moses, he entered the tent of Moses, the man of God, bowed down before him and related the entire story to him. He concluded his remarks as follows. Before I gazed upon your face, O man of God, I suspected that the artist had deceived, that the art, where are they, da, 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 had been incompetent, for my physiognomists are without peer. Now that I've established that the portrait is accurate, I can only conclude that the physiognomists are at fault. They have deceived me. Their wisdom comes to naught. I have been supporting them even as they misled me with their nonsense. Moses, the man of God replied, not so. Indeed, the artist and the physiognomists are exceedingly competent and wise. No, 
that if I were naturally virtuous, I would be no more deserving of praise than is a block of wood. For it too has no human faults. I am not ashamed to admit, however, that I am naturally inclined to all the vices listed by the physiognomists, and then some. With great effort and determination, I overcame my inclinations until their very opposites became second nature to me. Well, <clears throat> that's very interesting as a medrash. The question is, where did this medrash come from? And do we find it believable as uh, a medrash chazal? The problem is that um, the medrash has no um, pedigree. You won't find it anyway, anywhere in the Midrash or Chazal. And it's found to be in very, very few places. We'll have to try and trace where it actually came from. But from the very earliest um, time after the Tiferes Yisrael published this, it raised the eye and the hackles of all the Gadolim. When they read this, they were up in arms. They said, you've taken this from a pagan story, haven't you? There's no way we can imagine that Moshe Rabbeinu's complexion was other than filled with chen and, and beauty. To say that he actually had a face which was, if you like, compatible with evil, but he turned himself round, that's not the Moshe Rabbeinu we recognize. And indeed, they quote many Medrashim. Everyone knows the Medrash, that when Moshe Rabbeinu was born, it says, Rashi quotes this on the Chumash, when he was first born, before he was hidden in the bulrushes, that his complexion lit up. It said the whole house was lit up um, with light, a radiance glowed from his face. And even the Egyptian princess realized there was something special with this little baby. Now, what you're saying, this is entirely the opposite, that he looked like an ogre when he came out. He, was, he, had, a, he had a face of evil. And he didn't have a face that brought light to the whole environment. That seems to be the message coming out of this uh, artist's story. And so they were fuming with Tiferet Yisrael. They said, Tiferet Yisrael, Rabbi Lifshitz, you have nabbed this from some, first of all, they said it came from a German nursery rhyme and that he'd somehow managed wrongly to embed it here to a, a description of Moshe Rabbeinu and nothing could be more outrageous. And in the 50s, a whole set of series of Mishnahs came out with, with based upon Rabbi Huda Leib Maimon, who was actually also a politician of sorts here. He, one of the signatories on the independence, the um, um, uh, uh, independence certificate of the state of Israel, uh, at Godel, um, he was, um, he insisted that the princes should leave this extract out of the Tif Tiferes Yisrael, because it was unworthy of the Tiferes Yisrael, was based upon an error. Uh, um, I'm lucky to say that my Mishnah does have it in. Some will, and some won't have this story in. Did Moshe Rabbeinu really have, was he really genetically, if you like, born with an evil complexion, which would have made him an evil person? And then he just overwhelmed it with his, his greatness. I mean, in some ways, it's a beautiful story. Isn't it? We have Moshe Rabbeinu was born really bad, but he was able to overcome all those negative impulses, which makes him all the greater. And yet the sages would not accept that Moshe Rabbeinu was born genetically bad. He had to be genet genetically perfect, and they did not like the story that Tiferet Tiferet thought was a beautiful story, and he didn't understand what all the fuss was about. Anyway, so that shows you how, how this, this is a very uh, uh, interesting level. Uh, of argument, really, on what was a story that didn't have very much of a pedigree. When scholars looked into it, there's a whole very, very long paper that was written by Professor Schneer Lehmann, who was a very famous um, academic, from academic in Brooklyn College in America, and he wrote a lengthy paper on this, trying to, uh, quoting Shaw Lieberman and many others, because this became the subject of a lot of controversy. Where did Tiferes Israel pick this up from? He didn't just run with it from nothing. He must have had a source. Um, and the fact that it was being so heavily criticized by many obviously showed that this is a source that wasn't available to most people. You wouldn't have Rav Deskin and Rav Maimon and everyone else who knew the whole of Shas and Medrash um, up in arms if this was a Medrash that could be found anywhere. So, um, 
The, the scholars find that this actually first appeared in a Hasidic Sefer in 1809. But the Hasidic Sefer was not very well known. And there was no one there to really attack. Anyway, which Lithuanian Gedolim were interested at the time with a Hasidic Sefer? They would have laughed at it. But the same story about Moshe Rabbeinu and the artist already appeared earlier on. In other words, it predated the Tiferes Yisrael, and it came from a Jewish source. So he didn't make it up. He didn't take it out from a German nursery rhyme. He must have had a common source from this, from this particular uh, Sefer. Maybe not from the Sefer, but from a, 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 um, a, a common source. Um, <clears throat> there is a source here, which I'll bring you, um, uh, which, which was found much later on from someone called Eliyahu HaKohen, died 1729, essentially died, you know, maybe a hundred years before the uh, um, Tiferes Yisrael wrote this commentary. Now look what he writes and see if you recognize the, um, the story. It's all about Aristotle. Because some of the early scholars were very keen on Aristotle. Aristotle was learned in reading palm prints. Once a scholar who claimed similar expertise visited Aristotle's city. In order to test the claim of the visiting scholar, Aristotle pressed his own palm on melted wax, gave the print to his disciples, and told them to ask the visiting scholar for a reading. The scholar examined the print and said, it is the print of a murderer and a scoundrel. This is Aristotle's print, adept in every wickedness, who is nonetheless a great scholar. The disciples, mocked the so-called scholar, reported the reading to Aristotle. Aristotle informed his disciples that the scholar was learned indeed, learned indeed, and everything he said was true. Aristotle explained, my wisdom has enabled me to overcome, even to nullify my ill-fated destiny. So here you see the same story, really, but it's about a palm print rather than a portrait, and it's about Aristotle, who was very much worshipped as one of the greatest thinkers, and in a sense, and not, not a heathen thinker either, by Hazal, Rambam, had great respect for Aristotle, and many of the earlier scholars also. So over here, this was meant to be um, another beautiful pen picture of, um, of Aristotle by uh, a, a from writer, Eliyahu HaKohen. So what happened? It does seem as though the story of Aristotle was somehow merged into the great hero of the Jewish world, uh, who is uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, and, the, school, and, the, and the, um, the story was slightly changed. Someone who was, if you like, genetically bound for bad things was able to use his free will and his powers of uh, intellect to turn himself around uh, completely. So that would seem to be the case from here, um, that it came from, Ari from the story of Aristotle. And this could be where, at what point did Aristotle become Moshe? That's not very clear. And who was the first person to translate Aristotle? Was it this Hasidic Shereba, who we don't know? Again, we, don't, we can't trace it all the way back. What is even more interesting, and uh, this is, um, um, I think this was from another scholar in, in America, he found the earliest reference to this story um, dated back to 45 BCE, which goes back another 1800 years from Eliyahu HaKohen. And guess what? It was a, it, apparently in a book, or shall we say a publication of Cicero, Cicero's Tusculan Disputations. And in these disputations, this story that we've just seen here, or a similar story, is told about Socrates. Not about Aristotle, but about Socrates. So the earliest version of the story is 2000 years old and starts with Socrates. It seems to have gone on. Socrates became, was very popular in his time, and then he became less popular. Aristotle became the great Greek philosopher that everyone, you know, fawned about. So therefore the story perhaps was translated and transferred to Aristotle. And then the great Jewish hero was Moshe Rabbeinu. And people like this sort of story so much, a person who's essentially genetically born the wrong way, but has turned himself around, that it was perhaps reflected onto Moshe Rabbeinu. It still seems very strange that anyone have the chutzpah 
to place this story in relation to Moshe Rabbeinu, that he's, you know, that his, his complexion was so uh, evil and uh, so uh, disreputable, and yet he became such a great person. This is certainly not the madrashic view we have of the great Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, and yet it's the one as we see in the Te Teferis Yisrael. So I, I bring this in to you because you say there is some previous uh, uh, mileage here on this whole discussion of whether a person's complexion can reflect on their character. And it would seem from the stories that it can. It's just that a person can turn themselves around so extraordinarily. And over here, I think the use of it in the Gemara here is a little bit more narrow. It's saying that if a person displays chen, you could read their face, you can say, this is a Yirei Hashem. Maybe the guy's only good looking. Maybe the girl's only pretty. Who says this chen shows that they're God-fearing? No, if they display what's called chen, this magic impression, this halo, this ring of confidence, not, not ring of confidence, uh, this ring of refinement, um, then you can say that they are God-fearing. Uh, so I wanted to bring you the story. I think it's only narrowly related to this, but it's good fun anyway. And uh, I think we'll stop over here. Next week, um, I won't be giving the share. I think we'll be probably resume after Sukkot. Um, not even sure what's next week. Is it Sukkot already? Yes, probably is. On oh, no, Sukkot. Yes. Okay. So after after Sukkot, will we will re uh, emerge and take the Gemara further? Thank you very much for joining me. Very much. Thank you.